Hi everybody, welcome to Read Watch Play. We apologize for being so late. It is a big day here at Kerwin's Game Store. The new magic set, Ixalan, is releasing this week and we are opening up boxes and boxes and boxes of it to prepare for selling singles this weekend. So um, we did a box opening video right before this that ran a little long and that'll be posted on our website and YouTube uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, Liam, our, uh, our buddy Liam Johnston, who's gonna be in our Poughkeepsie store soon, is gonna take you through what we opened in the box. So stay tuned for that. However, today, we're gonna talk about comics this week. We're gonna talk uh, Kingsman 2 review, maybe a Star Trek Discovery review, although only 50% of us actually watched it, and the other 50% uh, hates the world. Uh, and then, uh, and then I'm gonna briefly- Not all the world, all the time. <laughs> just some of the world, some of the time. Just, just, uh, just, uh, just anybody trying to make a buck, apparently, so. Um, we'll have, Off of we'll, me. We'll have that discussion later. And then I will briefly recap uh, my Star Trek Ascendancy game from this past weekend. Four players, it was epic. I've got one picture to show you how crazy it was, and I am your host, Tony Cox. With me, as always, is... Clifford Parmeter. Uh, and let's jump right into it, Cliff. Uh, let's talk comics. There's so many comics. So much comics. Let's so start off comics. with Action Comics, number Another... 988. Another gorgeous lenticular cover. Woo! This one is Jarrell and Laura looking at baby Kellel as Krypton's about to explode, and then exploding Krypton. Oh, wow. And this is the Oz Effect Part 2. Yes, it is. So this picks up from the revelation that uh, Oz in the Mysterious Cloak is actually Jor-El. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. And he kills Z his brother, zor Oh uh, Yeah, he killed Zor-El, yeah. Was that at the end of Action Comics? The, or end, of the end of Supergirl 13. Supergirl 13. Right. Oh, right. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so... He's a bad, bad man. He's a bad man. Um, so anyhow, so this is Jarrell's story, basically, um, where he tells Clark how he was ready to die. He said, I sent you to a world that I thought was going to embrace you with open arms. And then I survived the explosion. I, your mother died in front of me, and something kept me and held me and brought me to this earth. And I awoke in, in a place of despair where... Where, where food was being used as a weapon of war. Starving people, you know, was used to torture them. And they kept hiding him because he's a foreigner. Mm -hmm. So they kept hiding him so he wasn't exposed to the sunlight, right? And he said he doesn't know if his powers were suppressed because of the person who put him there in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Or if his powers were suppressed because he was not exposed to solar radiation. But he was finally exposed... Uh, I, the young man in the family was so hungry, they were trying to protect the foreigner. They told him, look, now they're using starvation tactics, we're going to have nothing left to give you, because they were feeding him. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, tending to him, and they're like, you have to go. So the militia comes in whatever undisclosed country this is. Uh, the young boy who was starving basically sold out his family, right? So, you know, because he wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. They round up his family right in, in the square, and, um, and Jarrell is there, right? And, uh, and they, they, put, uh, they put an automatic rifle in the boy's hands and say, all you have to do is pull the trigger, and you'll be treated like a prince. You'll get all the food and water you want. He goes, they're the ones who betrayed their nation, right? And he goes, I can't do it. And the guy says to him, it's easy, and puts his hands over the boy's hands and pulls the trigger and murders the family. And Jarrell is overcome with rage and outpours the heat vision. And uh, Jarrell goes to face the boy. And I'm not sure what Jarrell's going to do to the boy, right? Because he felt for the boy when he first saw him. But then the boy just starts pulling the trigger on Jarrell to try and protect himself. And at this point, the bullets are just flying right off. And then Jarrell is pulled away from there. And then Jarrell is shown more and more atrocities committed, committed by mankind by whoever his mysterious captor is. And so he's just horrified that the earth keeps going on, people keep going on, they keep not learning from the mistakes, the rich, the powerful, corrupt, just keep on doing what they're doing, you know, with no regard for human life. 
and he sees how hard his son works and how noble his son is and no one appreciates it and he's like we have to leave this planet you don't belong here wow so that is action in a nutshell big woo for me because you know whichever or whoever this Jarrell is you know even if he's not he's not traditional Jarrell yeah. or as I suspect, super traditional Jarrell, because even the rocket ship they show leaving Krypton is like the old school rocket ship. Wow. You know? Um, so, yeah, so I, of course I don't suspect, I suspect this is Jarrell, but not the Jarrell. Gotcha. And um, so, anyhow, big move for me. I like that. That was very good. Um, yeah, it ties in well with the other stuff that's coming up. Which is next on our list. I'm gonna talk. Okay, so we take a break from Drell to talk about Batman the Murder Machine. <laughs> Another metallic cover, part of the Dark Knight's lore. Now this is the cyborg esque. This Batman. is the cyborg esque Batman. So on Earth, but it's so funny. Earth, I think it's Earth negative forty four, because it says Earth, and then there's a little dash forty four instead of Earth dash forty four. Because it's from the Dark Multiverse. Ooh. So it's like Earth negative 44. So here, Alfred has died. He's been murdered. He was cracked by Bane right in the Batcave. Wow. And um, so anyhow, it's just tragic. Everyone's there. Clark and, and, and Wonder Woman and Cyborg. And uh, so anyhow, they're like, come on, Clark. They're, come, come on, Bruce, go upstairs. It's the wake. You've got to do this. Um, you know, we all know how awful this is. It's disgusting, you know? Um, but you have to. You have to put yourself together. He pulls Cyborg aside and is like, hey, I, like, Alfred's like a father to me and I have saved his consciousness and maybe you can help me with some software and we can save Alfred. Right? So weeks pass and Alfred is all over Gotham City materializing like a freaking holographic virus that keeps appearing saying how may i serve you how may i serve you and just murdering all of batman's villains and then alfred wants to come home to the bat cave and he's like sir let me in sir let me in sir let me in cyborg is there and he's like don't let him in bruce he goes i helped you because we were going to come up with a program so there'd be someone to basically feed you soup and tell you when you're working too hard you know <laughs> You know, like, not this. This is horrible. He's like, but if I let him in, we can fix it. He's like, no, don't let him in, Bruce. Don't let him in. We will fix this. You're brilliant. Come up with another way. Just no. Anyhow, Bruce let him in. The technology took over Bruce. So he, this, this Alfred AI and Bruce's mind all become this new cyborg-like Bruce. Um, and you know, and he takes out just about everything and anyone that stands in his way. And then that's, and then of course, once he feels like he has control of the world, that's when he realizes that his world is doomed. And then he's approached by, uh, you know, by the laughing Batman, um, who says, you know, you should come with me, you know, to a world that's destined to live and, you know, we can make it better. Um... So all of this is being told while he is confronting Cyborg on the Justice League satellite. Cyborg is worried about his dad, who's in Star Labs, Detroit. Cyborg is secure on the Watchtower. So they're having their chit-chat. And he's like, I've been blocking your attempts to take over the Watchtower. And he goes, you fool. He's like, I only want to access to Star Labs. So then all these bat, all these bat creatures start taking over Detroit. Hmm. Because he got access to, to Star Labs there. However... Cyborg's dad seems to be okay and keeps... See, there you go. Cyborg's dad seems to be okay and keeps talking to Cyborg to see if he's all right. And he's getting beaten to a pulp by the entire team of Dark Knights. You know, so Dooms, Doomsday Batman, Fl Flash Batman, the Red Death, they're all there. It's all horrible. And um, that's... Oh, yeah, he ripped out his, the spinal column of Cyborg on his own Earth. Then it's revealed to us by Laughing Joker that um, Cyborg's metal, Cyborg's cybernetics, are actually a huge threat to them, but because Cyborg won't go give in to his full potential, you know, allowing the cybernetics to just take over him, right? He doesn't realize that he's a threat to them. So that's a little cliffhanger, sort of, until uh, the next one is going to be the, uh, the Dawnbringer. 
which is the Green Lantern Batman. We're going to get that story next. I like the artwork in this. Oh, the artwork is, is telling. It's telling. Yeah. Right? It's amazing. It's great artwork. And of course, he's taken over the Watchtower, and he's told, and it's essentially they've almost taken over the world at this point, the, the Dark Batman. Wow. Now, does this all take place on Earth negative 44? No, the flashbacks are negative 44. Oh, the flashbacks. Oh, the flashbacks is telling. Yeah. Oh, I got you. And so when he's attacking Cyborg, That's he's attacking present. he's attacking the Cyborg on on Earth Prime. Yes. The one he does or choose, not Earth Prime, but on yeah, Earth, Earth Zero. The Earth one he chooses Zero. not to murder. Wow. Wow. So. Oh, woo, Big Woo. Big Woo. Yeah, I, I actually like the origin stories of the Dark Knights yeah. better than I like anything else from Metal. Wow. I, maybe I'm a monster for saying that, but they're very good. It's interesting. All right, that's going to bring us to... Yeah. To comics. So, does this cover look familiar to anybody? Does it seem familiar? Does it remind you of a movie that's 40 years old come December 15th? Of 2018? Well, it, if I'm not mistaken, this is this reminds me of Zod's Trial. Absolutely. From Superman the movie. Yes, exactly. Oh. So this is Tim imprisoned by Jarrell. By Jarrell Jarrell. Jarrell Mr. Oz. Mr. Oz. Yes. Wow. And so he reveals himself in this issue to Tim. And this is really cool. So if you cut to the next cover. So the other cover is the Lonely Place of Living cover, because that's the name of the storyline, right? Yeah. And so I love that. So the Lonely Place of Living. And then if we cut to the next picture, it's an homage to part one of A Lonely Place of Dying, which was the story that introduced Tim Drake to us. Whoa. So it's great, because Tim Drake has to explain his origin to Jarrell while he's being interrogated. And he answers all of Jarrell's questions. And Jarrell's like, you're really forthcoming. He goes, yes, because it takes less... It takes less energy from your brain to tell the truth. So I just keep telling you the truth while I'm busy decoding these computers to get out of here. So he drops the rings that are keeping him in place. He drops them. And then he tries to attack Jarrell, which, of course, is futile. And uh, Jarrell's like, okay, but just remember the pr real prison is your own mind. And takes off. So he's, like, alone, just the walls of those monitors around him. He's trying to figure out his hack of the computers so he can get out of there. And someone comes, and Batman comes to rescue him. And Batman is using a gun. And not only is this Batman not the Batman he knows. Oh, by the way, the gun he uses is the gun that killed Martha Wayne and Thomas Wayne. Oh. So he says, who are you? Why are you doing this? And he whips off, rips off his mask, and it's future Tim Drake. And he's like, I would never become Batman. And it's like, yeah, buddy, you've said that before in the old Teen Titans comic. <laughs> Look what happened there. So uh, he takes off. He takes off with him because they are being pursued by Doomsday. So someone took a Doomsday, and it's in there. Sorry, something was flying around. It was a moth. Yeah. Uh, so. Oh, woo for me. Woo? Oh, woo. Very cool. Yeah. Oh my god, this was such a... This week is... it. There's so many comics this week, I'm exhausted. Exhausted. Yeah. Alright, so that's going to bring us up to Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. Yep, Fall of the Gods. This is the final chapter. With So yeah, those big metallic, you know, guardians. Yeah, the metal has nothing to do with the other metal. Oh. I was all excited for nothing. Okay. They get High Father. High Father's involved. High Father's... Father, who's also Darkseid's father, Yuga Khan, who's trapped in the source wall. This is all a ploy from, of his that he prepared should he be thrown in the source wall. Whoa. To kill his offspring and to free him from the wall. And, but, and of course they prevent it and High Father does a good job. And Hal and High Father have a good chat. And Orion lives. They save his life. And Kyle is completely exhausted. He has expended himself physically and power ring wise, and he's laying in the, in the infirmary, and uh, Orion, who's now healed, walks over to him and kneels beside him, and he's like, you know, I owe you Kyle Rayner. Which is fascinating, because here, High Father is alive, Orion is alive, Orion is snanking him, and meantime, we, over, we have High Father dead, and Orion taking over as the new High Father over Mr. Miracle. Hmm. So, big, huge, contrasting things. Um... It's a low woo, this one. Low woo. 
Right, because I wanted the story to be more, and it just, it's okay. Like, there's yeah. so much, so many things that could have happened with this. Were yeah. you, were, were, was the disappointment that it did not tie into Batman Metal? I was uh, hoping it would. Affect it? It had, that had a little bit of an effect, but not enough. Yeah. It, ultimately, the, the fact that, like, High Father was fine, and this does not tie into anything else with the New Gods. Hmm. You know, or even what's happening in Mr. Miracle. I just, it just... Yeah, that's kind of odd. It just felt like this flat story. And I'm really mad because the last time they went up against the new guys, that was an epic, epic storyline that also ended really flat. Yeah. But it was good. It, was, it wasn't awful. It was good. It's a solid, it's a solid story on its own tale. It's a fun Green Lantern adventure. Um... Next issue, Superman versus Hal Jordan. So I'm so down with that. Ooh. You know, Superman's already been running around battling Sinestro. So let's see how this goes. So that's going to bring us to Justice League of America. You all know how much I love my Justice League of America. I really do. I really, really, really do. Which issue is this? This one is number 15. So this is a Ray Palmer issue. Poor Ray is cut off here. But this is a Ray Palmer okay. issue. So, uh, so, ought... <laughs> There he is. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, yeah, there he is. So Ott, who is with the team, mm -hmm. who's in the other corner that is behind you. Um, so uh, Ray is like, no, he shouldn't be here. So we go. So it's part one of what really happened. Preon, the woman who had the belt that looked like the Adam, he fell in love with her. He made that belt for her. Her and Ott were traveling the microverse together to find out what caused that what's causing you know the microverse to die and it's called the ignition point mm -hmm. so prion can't make it and he tells her to teleport back use the belt right so she teleports away they run for their lives um they've seen all sorts of amazing things on their way there including worlds dying and he's like no we got to do something and prion is like listen it's awful it sucks but we are not gods and there's nothing we can do about it those worlds collided it's done you know, we got to keep moving. Um, so they have a great time in their adventures, of, although very, what do you call it, emotional, with stuff like that. So anyhow, he gets to the end with Ott. He finds the ignition point where this, the fabric of the microverse begins to become undone, and it looks like someone did it intentionally. And that's where we get the cutoff. So we don't know what more there is, but someone definitely <clears throat> caused this. And of course, I'm summarizing. It's just, it's a good book. It's a solid read. There's lots of character development. It's, and if you like the Adam, if you like Ray Palmer, this is very much Ray Palmer's story. He is a nice, dense, you know, like what have I been up to in the multiverse story. Very cool. It looks good too. Like, it, oh, the art is great. I the love the whole thing. Yeah. And like it, the, the panels just look like a nice flowing story. Yeah, no, and it's really, it's good. Like, I can't believe, like, I can't believe this is just a regular weekly book. Like, it was just epic. Oh, look at the splatter. The paint splatter. Yep. I love, I love it. I love it. I like when it's done properly. Yeah. I still got to get you the nightly news. Because that's got splatter stuff in it. All right. So, let's keep on trucking here. Two... Nightwing, the New Order. No, part is, two. Is, is part number two. Yes. So we're in a future where Nightwing has been exposed as Dick Grayson. He is, you know, the head of the organization that keeps supers under control. It's revealed to us that Coriander is the mother of this boy. Um, it's revealed that the boy knew he had powers before, but he finally got exposed to school. Mm -hmm. And his and Dick asked him, why? Why did you hide this? And he goes, because you talk about how bad supers are. I didn't want you to think I'm bad, too. So, as you know, as a father, that was a massively hurtful moment mm -hmm. for, for Dick. Then he gets home to Alfred, where they start arguing, right? And he's like, I will get him into the Justice League. They will train him. They will make an exception for me. <clears throat> we'll see about that, Dick. So then Alfred goes to bed with the son. And he goes, he goes, Dad talks about you all the time. But you guys aren't close. And he goes, we had a disagreement all you know a long time ago. And he goes, is it about the supers? And he goes, it was the people who were the supers that we had an argument about. In other words, like he felt what Dick did, even though it saved the world, right? 
the way he treated everyone yeah. was just like totally inhumane as a result. You know, like round them up, lock them up. Oh, and then he goes, and what do you normally do with one of these people with powers? And he goes, well, we send them in for treatment. If the treatment doesn't work, we put them in stasis until somebody finds a cure. And he goes, oh, and how many people have you released from stasis? And of course, he just gets an angry look back from, from Dick Grayson. Um, so anyhow, the, the woman that Dick works with attacks the house. She says, I'm sorry. She goes, I didn't give the order. They come through. They're little Bat Army Nightwing symbol dudes, you know, trashing through the house. You know, um, Alfred stands up to him. The, he doesn't want to hand over the boy. They shoot Alfred. Uh, Dick's son starts to power up. They shoot the kid and Dick both with tranquilizers. And take them away and to be continued. Does, isn't he that woman's boss? Yep. But his child is a super, so now... Wow. Yep. So now it, so now it does wow. not matter. So what do you, how are you liking this one? I It's for a probable future storyline. I don't know. I'm a sucker for these. Because it's kind of like, well, why do I want to get it if it has nothing to do with the main, with the main storyline? Right, right. right? But... It's really well told. So, like, I'm down with... I'm always down with the ones that are really well told. Yeah. You know, like, all the really great Elseworlds and What Ifs are just really good stories and just fun new takes on people. And this isn't even a new take. This is someone we know and other people we know put in a brand new scenario in a probable future. We'll see how it goes. I really like it. It definitely gets a big woo for me. because, Especially because it's just a different story. Yeah. You know, like, it's a good Nightwing story, you know? And I'm just, like, I'm down for it. I'm gonna sidetrack just for a moment because I, I because even though I love Superman to death, and of course by extension I don't like Batman very much, but other people love Batman to death. We need more comics that are not just about Superman and Batman. And even though Nightwing's in the Batman family, so it makes it a little eh about me, I like this a lot. And uh, Phil Menes had put up a picture from a pitch he had done several years ago that never went anywhere. And it was all the previous women who've been Wonder Girl or a version of Wonder Girl. And they're all together and they're all peering into like the, um, a scrying pool, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so it's like Donna Troy, it's Fury, who's Wonder Woman's daughter from Earth 2, um, it's just everybody who, oh, Cassie, all of it. Everyone who's been a Wonder Girl mm -hmm. of some sort. And the Scrying Pool are all new Wonder Girls, right? Mm. And, you know, and that pitch never went anywhere and nothing ever became of it and it was kind of scrapped. And I'm like, what a great story that would have been. Just mm. something totally new and different. And it could have been a more optimistic version of this, what we're getting with Dark Knights. Yeah. You know? So I said, someone needs to revisit that pitch. I said, worlds will live, worlds will die, and wonders will be born. That's how I would pitch it. That's how I would pitch it. Trademark. Yep. There you go. All right. Uh, next up, Suicide Squad, number 26, Dark Knight's Metal Tie-In. Welcome to Poison Ivy's Jungle. Very much so. Didn't they play? Well, we'll find out later. Uh, so Dark Knight's Metal tie-in the main threat is still the laughing joker mm -hmm. laughing jokers damien comes at them full force crazy he attacks at ridiculous speeds where dick is like you're too fast he's like ah, i've always been too fast for you dick ah! you know poison ivy is just crazy and angry and um <coughs> is that harley that's harley because she's trying to snap Ivy out of it. She's like, I'm your friend, I can help you. And she's like, no! And she's like, oh, this is not going well. Um, also, at the beginning of the issue, they actually show Waller giving Ivy and, uh, and Killer Croc the order to go in. Mm -hmm. So they're there, they have their big fight. Um, they kind of get the Ivy thing under control. And of course, what, that sphere shows up and takes one of the cards, right? Um, I guess without spoiling too too much else, the spheres, as I thought, do belong to Mr. Terrific. Yeah. And he's like, we're going to bring fair play back to Gotham City. So the next chapter is they're going after the Mad Hatter. You know, because they kind of fixed up the uh, the Ivy situation. Although the, uh, the brainwashed uh, Suicide Squad Titan members are still lurking about. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this quelled them or not. And also Ivy had nothing to do with that. Like, Starfire just starts showing up and blasting, and Ivy's like, no, my babies, it's the plants. So. 
definitely a woo. I'm mm-hmm. like again, I'm liking this more than I like the main story. I like all yep. the side stuff. Yep. It feel this makes it feel like an event. That's awesome. All right, next up, switching over to Marvel. Generations of the Spider. Yes, Miles Morales and Peter Parker. Now this is interesting because isn't currently Miles Morales is in the regular universe? He is, and there's a big controversy of how he's being portrayed. Really? Uh, the last issue of his title kind of revealed that he may be an ex-con of some sort. And a whole bunch of tropes that are not sitting well with, uh, with readers. Isn't he like 14 or something? I mean, he's supposed to be, but I don't know. Just it's weird. He's I didn't read it. I didn't read it. Convict at fourteen or something. I don't know. Just something. I didn't read it, so I don't know. I only know that my Twitter was on fire. You know, you know, you y'all understand when Twitter's on fire. What are all these tweets? Oh, they're very angry. <laughs> and they were all directed at Bendis. But so neither here nor there. I'm gonna judge this title on its own. And so click for the next one so you can see the artwork. Right? So once again, the artwork matches the era. And the day Miles shows up, um, Peter's just a mess. And he's a total mess around Peter. And he does not get to communicate with him the way he does. And he yells at him to go home. And he goes home and finds his younger self playing with his cousin, talking about, oh, I want Hulk hands. And his mother is there. You know? And, uh, and of course, she's like, can I help you, young man? He goes, no. He's like, the kids are cute. I, you know, I'm just, I'm a long way from home. And then he leaves. And then he comes and finds Peter. And this is, what, this is an epic night for Peter. Because if you saw Spider-Man Homecoming, it's a little, a little homage to the story that was homaged by the movie, right? Mm-hmm. He tells him, my aunt is dying. The only one who could cure her is Doc Ock. So I went after him and he dropped the building on me. So this is the night that Peter thought he was going to die and had to use all of his strength to push that building's debris off of him. So they do yeah. a visual recap and that's the conversation they're having here. And, uh, and, so, and he goes, and so what, what was your day? And he's like, well, I saw my mom and... It was weird, but, you know, he goes, when you're in this business for so long, you only remember the negative. And he's like, and I saw myself, and I saw myself having a really good day. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, Peter, st- Peter gets the phone call that Aunt May is okay. That the, the serum that Spider-Man brought worked. Right? She's cured. And she'll be home in a day or two. And now Peter has, can stop waiting for that phone call. And they just chit-chat, and Peter becomes incoherent as he falls asleep. And, you know, and Miles just keeps talking to him, and then he fades away from back to his own time. You know, mm-hmm. much like all the other stories we've been told. But the last part of Generations is the one that's the most disturbing. Disturbing? Sam Wilson, Captain America, and Steve Rogers, Captain America. The Americas. So, it's all the heroes who had a moment where they faded to the past including Kamala and Carol, so they each have had their moment, right? Because Carol saw Marvell, Kamala mm-hmm. saw, mm-hmm. you know, young Carol. Uh, Sam shows up in World War II with experimental wings and meets Captain America. And he befriends him back before Cap even has a round shield. And he watches him develop into the hero that everyone knows and loves. And he gets to come home from the war. And he, and he knows that Steve is in the ice. And what happens to Sam is he does not stop living in the past. He lives his whole life. He becomes a minister. He watches all the events in Cap's life unfold on television throughout the years. He even sees himself become Captain America. And by the time he's watching himself become Captain America on television, he no longer connects himself with that person. And, uh, and it keeps going and going. And the, during the time where Steve became an old man, you know, Steve went to go visit him and talk, and they were still friends. Ne- Steve never knowing that this guy, Sam, and his Sam Wilson are the same person at all. Wow. So he develops a state, tight relationship with him. And then finally, um, the, uh, so then finally, like, so <coughs> whatever, whatever the, the, finally there's some major crisis that took place. And old Sam is like, you know what, I've, I've lived, I've been here a long time. 
I've lived a good and a complete life and all of that is for the young people and I'm done and I'm ready. And he goes to bed ready to just die in bed and give himself up to God. Even though he seems very, even though he's like able to get up and turn off the TV and everything, right? But he's just like, he's ready to be done, right? And uh, so he lays there in bed and of course there's just the, 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 the powerful light that takes place. And then cut back to Sam Wilson being interrogated. And now all of a sudden he has the memories of being Sam Wilson and being the other Sam Wilson. Right? Freaky. So he tells him, he goes, I don't know what he, so he says, I don't know what you want to talk to, want me to tell you. They're like, we told you this was completely voluntary. You're sitting there like staring into space. He's like, you know what? We're done here. He leaves. All the other heroes that this happened to are waiting for him outside. They're like, what took you so long? I told him to, Carol's like, I told him to screw off after five questions. You know, like, what took you so long? He's like, I don't know. He's like, I, I feel like, you know, just a man who's lived two lives or something like that. And uh, I forgot which one, one of the heroes actually like walks over and looks at him like, like, you know, like Sam, like there's just, there's this look on your face, you know, mm -hmm. like just like, you know, you look tired. Um, so anyhow, he just really just tries to decompress and think about things. And the final scene is uh, Cap getting off his bike. Um, and I'm assuming he's back in Brooklyn, right? And, uh, and just the shadow of Falcon up in the air, he throws the shield to Cap. Cap catches the shield, and there's a note in it from Sam Wilson. And he says, you gave me the shield, and you gave me a mission. And now I'm returning the shield to you, and I'm giving you a mission. He's like, you can earn their trust again. You can be their hero again. You can be all those things. He goes, you just have to believe it. And here you go. And that's the ending. And of course, he will go back to being the Falcon. And Falcon number one comes out next month. And now we know that the young girl, Cosmic Cube girl, is whatever was happening in the final struggle of Secret Empire caused them all to have this moment where they blinked out of time. So, and then of course, you know, the, one of the big reveals we got was the Thor Generations. So, Generations is over, so what does that leave us with? Marvel Legacy. Legacy. Dun, dun, dun. So, I chose this picture because, the, first of all, there's like 40 variant covers for this issue. I, don't, I can't even take it. It's like the regular one is in color, but the main variant is another lenticular, and it flashes back and forth between the color cover and the sketch cover. Ooh. So that's represented here. Um, anyhow, a very good issue as far as I'm concerned. It was a good start. Great. And um, so the, the meat, okay, so the meat of this issue is one of the Eternals was on Earth back in 1 million BC, right? And those Avengers, right, which is the Black, Can uh, Black, Hat of that, Black Panther of that era, the, the doctor of that era, the um, it's um, the it's phoenix Agamotto. of that. It's Agamotto. It's Agamotto. A phoenix, um, Agamotto. Odin, of course, yeah. who has his, who has his Mjolnir. Ghost and Ghost Rider on the mammoth. Ghost Rider on the mammoth, is there? Yes, and Starbrand. And Starbrand. Right. Well, whoever the Starbrand is, then. Which is like a Hulk dude. Yeah, he's very big. Like yeah, and um, so anyhow, they gotta like take this thing down. Right? And presumably they did. In the present... They're so they're, they're taking down the Eternal? The Eternal, okay. yes. And Odin is like, I've seen Eternals before. I know what they are. But this one is like literally here on the planet, digging through the earth, looking for something. What the hell is this? They're destroying everything in their path to find something. Mm -hmm. You know? So anyhow, they take it down. In the past. In the present, there are people digging in that area. Starbrand is going crazy. Um... Uh, Mr. Ray is there, the current Ghost Rider is present. They start getting into a fight. He goes into full Ghost Rider form. Um, there's other stories happening in between too, but I'll just tell you their fight, mm -hmm. the, the meat of their fight. Uh, for the first time ever, apparently this, this Ghost Rider has never used the pen and stare before. So he uses the pen and stare on Starbrand. And Starbrand like, what's the opposite of coming apart? Like, Collapses. Collapses. Like right. collapses on himself. Wow. Right? And, and and he's like, did I just 
did I just use the pen and stare? And he's like, this is too weird for me. He's like, I'm not sleeping in my car anymore. And he drives off the car. And then there's an ominous voice that says, you know, like, oh, one of them is gone. Like, we need to take out the others. And you see in the cave drawing everyone who was assembled there to put it together. But in the meantime, we, there's lots of story set up. Wakanda has their, has, is, is on their own planet now. The planet of, um, of Banth is their, is their cat god. I think it's Bath. So that the planet of the Cat God, that is now the Wakandan Empire. So they got their own alien world, chilling, super back on back on the top, baby, like they're supposed to be. Um, and of course, ominous things are happening there. Um, hey, hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Woo. So ominous things are happening all over. Um, and then the other really important part to me, there's lots of things that happen in this issue, but these are like the meaty things to me. Um, the other one that was really important to me is uh, everything is, <clears throat> you know, essentially kind of bonkers. Oh, and just stuff going on with Thor too. You know, I'm going to skip all that. But Johnny and Ben are together, and Johnny's like, do you think people even remember us? He goes, and do you even think they need us? And Thing says to him, Ben Grimm, he says to Johnny. Johnny Storm. Johnny Storm, yeah. He says to him, he goes, he goes, who cares if they remember or not? And how could you even ask that question? He goes, the fact that things are the way they are right now, it means that they need us now more than ever. And he fires, he fires the Fantastic Four uh, signal gun. And, you know, the four appears in the air. And then we cut to the edge of the multiverse somewhere, mm -hmm. right? After someone has recovered a blue stone in their battle, and then we kind of, like, flip the page from that blue energy to somewhere in the multiverse, and it's Valeria and Franklin, and they're being brother and sister, calling each other butthead and farthead, and uh, Valeria sees something. She sees something she wants to pursue, mm -hmm. right? And Franklin's like, you know, come on, Dad found something. And she's like, ah, oh, all right, and they like, and they take off, and like that's the last panel, and it ends with the Fantastic Four symbol at the bottom of the page. Um, so of course, if you've been reading up on what's coming, Marvel Two and One featuring the Thing and the Human Torch. Will be coming out next month, mm -hmm. um, and there that series will follow them teaming up monthly with various Marvel characters and heroes and their, and their search for the Fantastic Four. Wow! So I'm sure they're going to drag this sucker out a year or two before they finally commit to it, but we will eventually get back to the four. Also, we see the Marvel Two and One cover, uh, the modern cover. It's Marvel, and then the two is the Fantastic Four symbol as a two. Yeah. So I was pleased with that. This was, uh, again, one of the more expensive books, but this was a good launching point mm -hmm. for where we're at, so I approve. Awesome. Uh, all right, I think we're going to heavily discuss one more and then do our quick oh, I'm gonna rundown. Be, I'm going to be, yeah, I'm just going to be quick at that. <clears throat> Faith in the Future Force number three. I love it. Everyone's there. They have no idea what they're doing. They <laughs> all keep losing. Um, <laughs> blood squirts. Oh, we can't see him anyway. So blood, blood squirt dies, and they continue fighting. And blood squirt shows up riding, riding some dog or something. He's like, blood squirt may be dead, but blood squirt rides again. And I'm just like, oh my god. Wow. Um, but yeah, they're being decimated, and of course, the thing that they're fighting that looks like a toaster. Yeah. Right. It is taking on all of their traits, all of their powers, everything. So the really? time the time walkers like we're just feeding this thing, and Faith wants to confront it, and then they all get knocked out rather than than killed, mm -hmm. and they awaken and they awaken in this thing's home, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he has replicated himself, and he goes, "This is all your fault. You people destroyed my home and my race." And he goes, "And now I'm gonna wipe you out of existence." So that's the villain's motivation. Ooh. But f and all Faith can think is, but if we figured out how we did this to you, we could just end it and none of this would even have to happen. So now Faith is on to something. And again, things get out of hand. And now, and, and now this creature commands a, an army of himself to come after them. And they're all being decimated. And as usual, Time Walker is running for her life with scraps of paper to give to herself. And this time she, now of course she approaches Faith. This time they hit the street, and then this time when they hit the street, the sky is coming apart. Right? So like yeah. all the other times that she's talked to her, now the sky is coming apart while they're talking. Um, and she goes, listen, 
She goes, I'm doing this all wrong. I'm acting like my predecessor. I traveled with him. He kept secrets. I Maybe I shouldn't be keeping secrets. So all the scraps of paper she had, she put them out in front of Faith. So Faith could read them and they could think about it. And then Faith has the idea again. She goes, if we can figure out what caused this and prevent it, yeah. that's our solution. And she goes, so what are we going to do? She goes, I think I know someone who has a plan. And then, of course, to be continued. You know? Oh, yeah, but it was savage. And even, uh, what's his name there? The powerful one from the Renegades. He's like, whatever this thing is, it's as powerful as me. Maybe it's as powerful as Harda. And Time Walker's like, maybe we should go back and get Harda. He's like, you really want to bring that psycho into this? She goes, listen, I, we're trying to save the universe and all of time. Later on, we can argue about who wants to take over the world. <laughs> so I thought that was great. That's amazing. Uh, so Big Woo? Big Woo. Oh. It's, still, it's fun. I'm having such a good time. You know, That's and awesome. like the story is progressing by them slowly, slowly learning something and figuring it out. Like that one episode of Star Trek. I was just thinking, cause and effects written yes. by Brandon Braga. Three, Captain Sir. Commander Riker has three buttons on his. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, I was like, go, Data! He can press the main shuttle bay. Yeah. Right. Uh, do you have anything for a quick rundown, or is that it? Is that oh it? my god. All right, quick rundown is Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider Man number four by Chitsarsky. Chip Zinnerski. Go Go Power Rangers number three. It's still very good covering the origins. This one gives us the origin of Bulk and Skull. And guess what? It, it'll touch you a little bit. Yeah? Yeah. Bulk's brother is very abusive and a bully to him. Wow. Uh, and Skull is his friend. And he goes, my mom is making beef stroganoff tonight. You can stay for dinner. He goes, you do that for me? He goes, yes, you're my best friend. You're like a brother to me. You know? And they're such cute, sweet kids. And then cut to the present to them being... Two jerks. Wow. You know, but I thought, but at least this like lent, lent to who they were. And of course, First Strike number four is out. First Strike Micronauts number one and First Strike G.I. Joe number one are also out and fading into our background. Yay! I like them, of these, I like the main story the most. I was not thrilled with the G.I. Joe crossover. Mm -hmm. I, it was, mm -hmm. it was like an interesting side adventure, sort of. It's, the G.I. Joe one will continue in a mask one shot. The Micronauts will continue in a ROM one shot. I want the story to be a more cohesive crossover. Yeah. But the main story is good. But the main story is really, you know, like Joe and the Transformers. Um, I you? think that is everything. Because, you know, we really, that is a lot. And this is not even all the comics that came out this week. There's so much more stuff. Oh my god, Venomverse stuff galore. Oh. Go at it. Go at it, guys and girls. All right, so let's hop into what did we watch. And um, we were fortunate enough to have a great sequel, a potentially great sequel opening this week. Kingsman the Golden Circle, a sequel to Kingsman the Secret Service. Um, which, uh, which, your thoughts first on Kingsman the Secret Service. Oh, I loved it. Great movie. Great movie. Uh, very uh, surprised for me. I'd never read the comic. I didn't know anything about it. I, I just heard that it was good. Went. Uh, I, I it, it solidified my fandom of Matthew Vaughn, um, and 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 Mark Miller, and then I was very excited about the sequel. Uh, um, you saw it this past weekend. Uh, Adam and I saw it last night, and I have a funny story at the end of this. Uh, so in this story, we find out that. Um, the Golden Circle, who is uh, headed up by a uh, aficionado of the 50s who has secluded herself in the ruins. Uh, I don't, did they say where the ruins were? No, she never said where she, she was. She's like, I'm the in the middle are. of They're nowhere. Just these, old, these old, you know, ruins from thousands of years ago. Where she shouldn't be. Where, and, and she's rebuilt. Uh, 50s these, pop culture. 50s pop culture. Movie theaters. I named it all after herself. Yep, yep. Poppy, Poppy Mart. Yep. You know, Poppy's Diner. Poppy's Diner. Poppy's, Poppy's Theater. Theater. Poppy's Saloon. Salon. Saloon. Salon. Oh, my God. Poppy's Theater. Oh, my God. And, um... Uh, and she uh, is a drug dealer, a drug the manufacturer. Uh, yeah, the world's greatest yep. drug manufacturer. The, wor the, 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 the wealthiest, most successful businesswoman in the world. And nobody knows. And nobody knows. Uh, and she has a plan uh, to, to do something. We don't know exactly what it is at first. And through her process, she destroys the Kingsman. She thinks she destroys everyone, mm -hmm. but through an unfortunate turn of events, Eggsy is uh, is saved, 
and because uh, Merlin is not a top agent, um, he, he was not targeted. He was not targeted either. So they survive. Roxy's killed. Roxy's which is killed. Devastating. I was a little upset. Uh, can I just but, say the one thing I love about this movie is every single person that they brought back from the original yeah. is that actor. Yes. And continues their and it, journey. But it and it broke my life. heart that they brought Roxy back. Yeah. I thought when she jumped out of that bed, I and thought you know she was going to show up later on. Too, and you yeah. know what? They did this to us with the last movie. True. Maybe, may, you know, they have those tubes inside the thing, the pneumatic tubes. Yep. Maybe yep. she made it to a pneumatic tube. So uh, I can't wait for the next movie just to like hope. So Merlin, Merlin, and Eggsy uh, d institute the Doomsday Protocol, where they go into a wine, uh, a wine shop, a a tasting shop. room, yeah. um, and they discover a bottle of Statesman whiskey from Kentucky, United States. And th that's it. And they have no idea what it means. And they just start drinking. They just drink the whole thing. They're drinking a toast to everybody. Crying. And then... Merlin's telling Eggsy not to cry. <laughs> yeah, and, and then, then he's the one crying. After a few drinks, he's crying. Yeah. So he, they then discover that the, the Doomsday Protocol is, in fact, to go to Kentucky and meet Because the, the K team. in Kentucky in the bottle is the symbol for the Kingsman. Mm -hmm. It's sideways. Yeah, it's sideways, yeah. So then... They travel there, they, they they meet the statesman, and it turns out the statesmen have a special guest that they don't know who he is. And it turns out to be none other than Galahad, the original Galahad, Colin Firth's character, after he gets shot at the church, and they explain how that Amazing happened. Amazing flashback. Great. And that's why I want to yeah. believe Roxy will come back. Great way to bring back a character who you thought died in the first one. Yep. Uh, then he's got a little bit of a mind issue. They got to reboot him a little bit, which is which is kind of interesting the way they do that. Once he's back, then they have to go on a mission. You find out that Poppy has poisoned her drugs and is essentially holding uh, millions and hundreds of millions of people hostage to get a seemingly satirical president yes. um, to pardon her and legalize mm -hmm. drugs. Yes. Uh, and he decides to play along, but to let the druggies and criminals die. Because this is his way to be the president that yep. ended the war on drugs. Yep, to win the war on drugs. And yep. it's a bit of a topical conversation, and it's interesting the way that they approach it. Uh, and, and so our heroes have to go on a mission to find the antidote, uh, or to release the antidote to save the world. And uh, so, uh, first off, overall, overall thoughts and impressions on this. I loved scene. everything. I loved every moment. I was just screaming. From the moment he's fighting, first of all, he's fighting the dude who was a prick to him in the first movie, I who I assumed was dead, love... who also got to live. And they explained it beautifully. Yeah. It was so great. So, yeah. awesome cyborg fight. I was super stoked. And uh, that was a great opening for the movie. And of course, they're fighting to Prince's Let's Go Crazy. I just, it was the best, but, but, and now I'm going to, I'm going to reveal something very important for the movie. Poppy took advantage of our villain from the first film, kidnapping celebrities and notable dignitaries so that she could go ahead and kidnap Sir Elton John to be her personal, her personal musician and no one would And suspect. test subject. And test subject. Which, of course, she cures him because it's Elton. Hey. I loved him so much. He is the best special guest star in a movie I, ever. There's a moment where he goes nuts. Yes. Beats up the two guys that are holding him, like sec like security guys that are holding him there. Right, because he, and he's under the impression there is a rescue happening. And literally does a karate kick into one guy, smiling at the camera, smiling at the camera. with an aura of light behind him, with fully in feathers, huge oh, heels. Magnificent. It magnificent. Was and then when he came out of the theater, what was on the marquee, marquee above him? Oh, I didn't see. The bitch is back. Oh, that's right. Yes, it was amazing. That's right. It was amazing. Oh. Everything about Alton John, oh. everything was fantastic. It's the greatest cameo slash guest appearance I ever. It's too much movie. screen time for a cameo. Oh, it's a, it really it's is. a guest it really star. Is. I mean, and he, star. at one point, he saves he saves original Galahad yes. from the... By the way, does Matthew Vaughn hate dogs? I don't know. Maybe. Because they have to kill dogs in the first one. Yeah. 
In order well, no, to jog, I mean, really in order to jog, dog. in order to jog Colin Firth's character back, they threaten to shoot a dog. Yeah. And then there's two robot dogs at the end that they then kill and and maybe like it, like. Yeah, but they're robot dogs. I do feel for them. They're I, just little. They're just little murder <laughs> the machines. The symbolism, though. The symbolism. Well, I don't think it's about Matthew Vaughn. I'm sure who. Uh, maybe Mark <laughs> Miller. Right? Hate, hate but this dogs. is an original story, right? The sequel yeah, is an original well, story. I know, but it's still it's still coming. But from Miller from, wrote Miller wrote the script, right? With Vaughn or the first one, I believe. Yeah. But the set this one because this one's very Mark. Miller. Miller. Like it I don't, feels like I, I mean it's still a Marv production, it's still part of his Yeah, you know, his previous work. So like he still has a part he still I, has like it just, I, I feel like he had some heavy guidance in this one because it, it, it was so it was so tightly tied to the original story and the original aesthetic that I I can't imagine that he wasn't heavily involved. They did such a great job. Also really funny, they did not use Chang Tatum enough. I actually loved him. When he showed up, and I was like, oh man, this might be like one of my favorite characters he's ever played. Yeah. And then, of course, he's one of the victims of. Yeah, and the, he's put on ice. And, and he's put on ice. But the setup for his character, and follow me because I have a brilliant plan for his character for the sequel. Ooh. Well, that's right. He becomes of the, one of the yeah. Kingsmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's got the, yeah. the boulder yeah, hat the and, yeah, yeah. And, and everything, and the new suit, and he's in Europe. Yeah. And I'm wondering, just wondering, because of course I want justice for Roxy. Hashtag Justice for Roxy, that's me. I'm wondering if Roxy will turn up mm-hmm. and be his love interest in the next movie. Ooh, interesting. Because this way we get we do yeah. get Jax, we do get justice for for Roxy. Um, I also had a really dark premonition about what the next movie could be. Yeah. Right? Um, so major spoiler words start start covering your ears or whatever. We need, we need a spoiler bubble have, on the screen. I know, I keep saying that. For just when we're talking yeah. spoiler. So Eggsy becomes a prince at the end That's of the movie. True, yeah. Um, and I was... So so these, these movies to me feel like Iron Man and James Bond got together yeah. and like had love childs. Right? So I'm really, really, really like... Like if the next movie is dark... What if the next film is like Her Majesty's Secret Service and his wife is murdered and he wants revenge oh, and he wants no, to go... the Swedish princess. By the way, she, wasn't she fabulous? She's amazing. Like, for having such a small part in the first movie. Yes. And then, like, having... Like, that's what I loved is, like, they... They didn't like like other other movies like this. They they'll, they'll come in and they'll they'll find a way to bring in like name character named actors and yeah. actresses and, and they bullshit. and they still did that. They still brought in name people, but yeah, it's well, new characters. But it, like it just oh, it was so good. And Halle Berry, good lord, does that woman age at all? No, she How doesn't. How old she, is she? How old is she, Adam? Because <laughs> she she looks like She's I was like. That, she still skin, looks 28. Her skin looks amazing. She was glowing. I, she was I was glowing. like, she looks fantastic. She did. Did you see that scene where she's crouched down like freaking Spider-Man, ready to jump off the helicopter to go rescue um, no, Galahad? No. Yeah. So, so the helicopter. So we use the footage from the last movie. Yeah. The yep, camera yep. goes up to the helicopter. The helicopter helicopter comes to racing down yep. because she detected the technology in his glasses yep. from yep. her headquarters, yep. and she jumps off and uses their new technology to try and save him which of course they succeed in saving his life she just looked fantastic and i was so happy that she got to be whiskey's replacement of course and it's so funny too because she had said i keep trying to become an agent and, and the one keeps, who's blocking yeah, me is yeah, whiskey yeah. and of course spoiler alert again he is the traitor among the team but not to the villains for his own personal causes yeah you which know. i the other thing i loved was motivations across the board Everybody's motivation was completely believable. Yes, I was very satisfied with, and even the twist at the end with whiskey and and his thing. I mean, just right? Because he like, said, "I don't want to work for." You. He's like, "I'm not working for that jerk president." Yeah. He's like, yeah. two junkies killed the woman I loved and my yeah. unborn child," and it was like, "Damn, dude, do a hundred million people need to die because of this?" Like, well, and the, and the thing is, is even though they set that up, like, I'm not a big fan. Like one of my one of my minor complaints with Baby Driver mm-hmm. was that I felt like. They shift to a different villain late in the movie, and I was somewhat disappointed by that because I felt like I was not as invested in their conflict. 
by the end and similar to similar to this but for some reason with this it 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 they they sort of set it up earlier too when yes, they, 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 character they, shoots whiskey they telling it, Eggsy that he's 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 going to betray us they definitely set it up earlier and they made it obvious to the audience that he really was trying to knock the antidote away from him yeah you know the yeah. first being oh can i see it yeah. you know like that yeah. was that was obvious it was just enough to like really like fulfill that that investment, and yeah. then it pays off later on when he turns out to be the traitor. And when he needs to be snapped back into reality, she freaking uses the picture of his of his dead yeah. of his dead wife. Yeah. So there's little moments in the movie that by the time he gets there yeah. to be the bad guy, the latest yeah. bad guy, we have already been through a few steps getting us to that point. Yeah. It was it was really good. I was I was slightly disappointed that uh, I thought. Um, I thought Poppy was going to have a fight scene. I thought she was going to kick some butt. Uh, and that didn't happen. But... Um, there were so many other fight scenes. Yeah. It was, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, what was... What was your... What was... Was there anything... Was there anything about the movie that you didn't like? Or any negative part? Or anything that you were disappointed in? I mean, I was a little brokenhearted over Roxy. Roxy but like, yeah. nothing was... Bad, you know. I mean, unless you just really don't like over the top films, which I feel like you shouldn't be going. It's to just, just but it's that. so stylized that it yeah. works so well. No, because you are entering an adventure, and I really yeah. like that. And the first one does that for you too, and that doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. I loved it. I love the first one. I love this one. I was very happy. It was fun. You know, I wish it was a little more for Oxy. I wish it was a little more for the princess, but you know, we she got she got excellent school time, screen time. Um. But yeah, oh my god, boy, did they really get, pull your heartstrings to the movie, too. Yeah. I mean, they killed one of Eggsy's friends, you know, right in the beginning, yeah. and they killed Roxy. And he, when he's when he's fighting for vengeance at the yeah. end, like, he names everyone who was yeah. affected by this Taron guy. Egerton, too. Taron Egerton. Taron Egerton? That's his name, right? Yeah. Taron Egerton. Uh, very talented actor. Amazing, and Amazing. you can see you can see how much better he's gotten since the last movie. Oh my God! Please, did you see so. him in Eddie the Eagle? I did, I've been wanting to see that. Oh, so. you gotta watch it! It's so good. <laughs> um, one thing, the one moment where I was just like, ugh, was when in the bar, the guys in the in in the. Um, at, at the Statesman Distillery in yeah. the bar, get up. Well, that's not and, the distillery. That's just like a Texas bar. No, but the, yeah. but, but the, the, near, the, the bar. But I think it's on their property, isn't it? No, I don't think so. Oh well, it was built. It was built. I, I I assumed that it was like it was the bar near their distillery property or whatever. Yeah, it's near them. But you think when, you'd have a little more respect for the people from, from from the distillery? Well, the thing that was just weird <laughs> was when the guy, like the guy, just got up out of nowhere and like yelled at him to go away, like to like they set up that whole the fight where he, he goes, the F where word. he goes, uh, yeah, uh, where he goes. That probably was the oh, that probably was the moment that stopped me dead in my tracks for five seconds. Yeah, you know, but it also happened in the movie. It. And you know what? There's a lot, you know what? There's a lot of buttholes out there who are going to throw that terminology around, and so let them be villains. Um, I, I I thought that that moment was a little forced to set up the oh he's going to do the same thing he did last time, yes. and then they flip it and he's right like, he, he's where he has no coordination off. because he's he's like, off. Well, he has, yeah. no one thought he's not going to have depth perception. He's missing <laughs> no. a whole eye when the when the glass misses. I was like, oh wait a minute. I, there's so many things he missed because yeah. he and all the was like, oh, he's got to get it back together, which is true. There's a little yeah. bit of that where he really did have to pull himself back together. But also, the man no longer has depth perception. Yeah. What are you people and thinking? It, and it helps. I mean, the, the the scene is not lost because it helps to inform you that he has some issues. So it sets up whether or not you're going to believe him when he tells Eggsy that that you know whiskey's going to is 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 going to betray them. So it wasn't as. Um, I just getting into that setup was a little forced, but other than that, oh, and just Mark the Strong. movie was uh, Mark Strong oh. singing John Denver. Oh, that was just, another death that just drove me every crazy. Mo like the, the just the, you know I love I love Matthew Vaughn is so talented at um, at having this crazy stylized action. But having these really honest character moments and emotional moments, like when I forget what happens when. Well, I, th th isn't that what sells an over the top movie? 
is that you yeah, really have but, to have the characters. But you that, can't. It doesn't always gel, and it doesn't always no, work. No, these guys and make this it flows. Gel. This is really an amazing like, cast. The, oh yeah, right. Because yeah, really, yeah. cast cast can even make a bad movie good. Yeah. Because the acting is so good, you're like, well, I'm invested in the characters, even though this movie's garbage. Like, and this is just the kind of movie where it's super saturated, stylized, but the characters are really great. Yeah. The moment when she she wants him to practice eating with a fancy dinner. And he flashes and he, back. He flashes back to, to, Galahad. Um, to Galahad teaching him. And then he has that really emotional moment. And he, ta- he asks Mr. Pickles. And I just, 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 just brilliant. Just absolutely brilliant. Um, overall, huge woo from me. Oh, yeah, huge woo from me. Absolutely. Um, I, I was like, I think I was wooing in the movie theater. I, I, I sat through the so, end of the credits. Even though my heart told me there was going to be nothing, yeah. I still sat through the credits just in case. So, funny story, real quick. Adam and I went to see this. We got there a little early. We went to the, the community theater right next door uh, from the game store here. And um, they have two theaters. They have uh, a large, like, old stage theater, Art Deco style. Uh, and then they have a smaller theater upstairs. And it seats... Um, I don't know. What, what do you think it seats, Adam? Like 100 people? 80, 100 people, something like that. Um, and it's very, it's very, um, it, it's almost like a, um, uh, it's like, it's like, it's like stadium seating and, and the screen's really close. So it's, I really like that experience. And we go in there, we're talking and whatever. We see, we see this, this, um, this, this woman come in, probably 40s, 50s, and she's, she's talking to somebody coming up the ramp. And the ramp's pretty steep in that auditorium. And then we see another woman sort of shuffling to the side, again, 40s or 50s. And then they bring with them this, she couldn't have been uh, any younger than 80 years old. And she comes shuffling and they're holding her, she's hunched over, she comes in. They literally sit in the row behind us, one seat over from Adam. And the old, uh, the older woman starts flirting with Adam, asking him about the trying to steal his popcorn. Woman? Yes, she's flirting with Adam, she's talking to both of us, you know, she's, she's asking him to steal his popcorn or whatever. And, and I'm like, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, <coughs> they're here to see Kingsman two. Mm-hmm. Like, did they see the first one? Do they yeah. like? Is this like what's like? Is this just girls' night out? And they didn't want to see Lego Ninjago, yeah, so exactly. they came to see this, and they have no idea what the <laughs> movie comes into. So I'm like, hmm. Chatty Tatum's in this movie. Let's so, find well, out. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so the movie starts, and then the two younger women are talking, and I'm like. Are they gonna talk the whole time? I even looked at Adam. I'm like, are they gonna talk the whole time? And they, and then, and then they, they, they settled in, and we were all watching the movie. And when it gets to the part where, uh, at the very end, when Eggsy is about to kill Whiskey, or when they're they're both they're about to kill Whiskey, and there's always that moment uh, when um, when. Uh, uh, it's like the brief moment in time where it freezes right before he goes into mm-hmm. the thing. And the old woman literally yells at the screen and she goes, yeah, F you! Except she didn't say F you, yeah. she said the words. And oh my lord, I about <laughs> fell out of my chair. I was laughing. You can ask Adam. I could not hold it together. He was, was trying you? to be quiet. And I just was laughing so hard and I almost fell over. And I, I thought it was just, I was like, and that, that just ended. I was like, yep, they knew exactly what they were getting into. And <laughs> like, they, right, they yep, knew what movie they came yep, to see. Yep, yep. Even the old lady. <laughs> you know, it was amazing. And, and afterwards, she was flirting with Adam again. She's like, do you guys like the movie? Like, it was just great. Did you get her, did you get her number? Number, by the way, Adam. Uh-huh. No. Oh, no, man. She's gonna send a postcard to the store. Yep. She's gonna send a postcard. So he had his shirt on. Yeah. So. Cat and around um, the cat skills. It's gonna be a postcard. <laughs> so, uh, so huge move for me. Huge move for me. I can't, I hope they make a trilogy out of this. Uh, oh, they could do more. And also, that's the other thing that movie sets up. The next movie can be about Channing Tatum's character. It could be about. That's true. It could be about tequila. That's true. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, not. I love Taron Egerton so much that I really don't want that to happen. I want there to be just a really awesome film. Also, I want to see how they can manage if he can be a prince and a super spy. Yeah. Yeah. And that they could set up too where like maybe Tequila becomes like the new like the new like go to guy at the Kingsmen and every time there's a mission, Exy's like, Oh, I'll go do it and they're like, Oh, don't worry, you no, do your prince, prince stuff. Right. We'll, we'll have and you feed us intelligence because yeah. you're a prince. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, um, and and news coming out that Matthew Vaughn may be directing Man of Steel two. Did you hear this? Did you know this? I'm spinning. I'm spinning. Isn't it great? I'm spinning. Oh, God. 
Oh god, <laughs> it's too much for one day. And near Comic Con is next week. I just I only have I so know. much strength. I, I only know. have so much strength. All right, so let's quickly hop into. We were gonna do a review of Star Trek Discovery, uh, but one of us didn't watch it because I'm not forking out another five ninety nine a month. I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. You know, they need a better plan from this. And I know I'm not the only one. Um, so I will do a non-spoiler review real it's, quick. No, you can spoil it all you want. But I just want to add, in defense of me, okay, we have lots of streaming services. Amazon and Netflix being the top two, okay? This is not about that, right? What this is about is the fact that they release their episodes at once, okay? And Hulu and now CBS All Access are doing this piecemeal one episode a week thing. And... I'm not having it, you know, and not even for the five ninety nine. I'm mad at Hulu because they have their little price plan thing too. I'm just, mm, I'm not loving it. I might cave in, I might not. I have all sorts of feelings about it. Let's see, but I'm not this level of Star Trek fan, so that's okay. So and end, end of end of defensive rant. So Star Trek Discovery uh, episodes one and two. Uh, are really a prologue to the series. This is not the jump in, they're on the Discovery. We don't even see the Discovery in either of these episodes. We don't meet Captain Warka. We don't meet any of the other characters who are going to be in the show as series regulars at all. This is literally a prologue to setting up Michael Burnham's character. And I am amazed that the writers and producers had the balls to do this. Because normally this is the kind of thing that is told through flashbacks throughout a series arc. And they said, nope, we're just going to give it to you straight away so you can take the journey with Michael Burnham and you can see where she started and then you can see where she goes. Wow. And I applaud them for that because, and I'll tell you what, you guys know out there, I was not a big fan of the trailers. I thought the dialogue was was, was what rigid. a what a one eighty happening I, here. I, I no, I'm be, look. I'll I'll be honest. I thought I thought that it just it looked it looked cheesy. It looked poorly done. It looked bad. If and only I'll tell they would stop what, denying that they're in the Kelvin timeline. And I'll tell you what, uh, this thing starts. We start with the Klingons, full Klingon language subtitles. Um, it's a bit of a rough cold open because it's, it's so jarring with the new Klingon look and whatever, but I got, I just accepted it and went with it. Uh, and they're really trying to make the, the Klingons feel as alien as possible. And I appreciate that. And there's a certain, um, honor to the way that these Klingons are portrayed in that it, it it's, you, you can see where taking the Klingon mythology and going in this direction with it is completely believable and plausible. And I, I, I really like it. I like I, I, I like the Klingon characters. Do tell. Um, and and the way that it sets things up. So there's wait, 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 wait. okay, you, you you can't leave me hanging. Okay, you tell me that they take the Klingon mythology and they take it in this new direction. What kind of direction do they take it in? So, so they it's really less less warmongering, but more of that philosophy, or like how is it? Well, so here's the thing: is the the Klingons that we meet at the very beginning are sort of like a religious sect that 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 uh, follow this this Tukuvma. Mm -hmm. And he is a Klingon who uh, appears to have been weak as a child and was, was picked on and bullied and at some point was um, touched or anointed, however you want to call it, mm -hmm. by the teachings of Kalis, by the power of Kalis. Of course, it's always Kalis. It's always Kalis. Kalis appeared to me in the cave that day. Exactly. <laughs> no, it was he, me, the Clone War. And so uh, the, uh, they, they, they hint that the Klingon Empire at this point is uh, not all on the same page. Mm -hmm. There are 24 great houses. That's the Klingon mythology, mm -hmm. okay? And normally, from what we've seen in, in previous Star Trek, is there are 24 houses, and there is a high council, and then there is a chancellor of the high council, and that is the governing body of the Klingon Empire. And it is a unified empire, and everything that we've seen from TOS on, mm -hmm. in TOS, it's the, from, if, let's, I'm going to accept Enterprise canon and Enterprise and the Enterprise explanation for why the, the Smooth Ridge Klingons. Mm -hmm. So just go with me here. Uh, the, augment, uh, uh, the Augment virus affected Klingons that have the Smooth Ridges. They rose to power in the Empire. They uh, wanted to um, expand in a non-aggressive way because of, 
because of what we're about to see and the conflict with the Federation 10 years earlier to Kirk, okay? So now we know where this ends up, okay? So the, the Federation of the Klingons have had a conflict. There was an end to that conflict, and now they are, for all intents and purposes, at peace. Mm -hmm. But they are they not are in a cold... They are not allies. Yeah. They are mm -hmm. in a cold war to, uh, to gain resources, and that's really what the TOS is, what TOS is about. Mm -hmm. Okay, the augment affected uh, aggressive uh, uh, augment virus Klingons are have risen to power. They are taking over. They are trying to strategically gain new because um, every other every other week or every five episodes, it was always Kirk would beam down to a planet and say, "Hey, first contact. We're the Federation. Come in." And it's like, "Oh, you guys are just like these other people that just showed up. They're called the Klingons," and like you know this whole thing. So that happened a few times in, in TOS. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I gotta watch some episodes. It happened at least three or four times that I can think of. Where okay. it was like, oh, well, these Klingons were just here. What do you mean? Oh, it's happened. I mean, the, the trouble with triples is 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 a good example. Okay. Like that. Like even though that's about like the, but it's about the wheat and stuff, and it's all about the Klingons infiltrating that station and trying to poison the Federation's resources. I mean, that's really what that's about because all the triples end up dead at the end, and then they realize that the the quadrant saline has been uh, poisoned. And so, uh, and then there's a Klingon uh, infiltrator aboard the station. And so... Which, of course, they're able to play with in uh, Deep Space Nine. Exactly. Exactly. Arn Darvin. So, uh, so the Klingons... So we've only ever seen a unified Klingon house. And, or empire with all the 24 houses. So what they've done is they've taken the 24 houses and they've separated them culturally. They really, and you only get a taste of this in like this hollow, that's the one thing, a big change is um, uh, a lot of things are in hollow, like hollow recordings, which it's not canon, it doesn't like bleh, but they, in deep, there was an episode in Deep Space Nine where, where like 55% of the episode is, um, is Cisco in his office talking to this admiral. And they had this hollow technology where the admiral's like there in a hollow thing. The reason they do that is because it's more engaging. It's more active storytelling. You're not just talking to a screen. Okay. And so I appreciate that they, they chose to do this to make it more, more engaging and more exciting and more. I could take it or leave it. But I'm, I'm very it, used to the screen. Technology. But I'll tell you, it works so well. And when, as soon as I saw it in the two or three scenes that they use it in, I, I said, I said, okay, you have to do this in this day and age to keep people. You and I might be okay with that, but I think the general public, they, they're going to get bored watching two people talk screen to screen. Whereas with two people in the same room, seemingly in the same room, is really great. There's even a scene where, where, um, where they're about to, um, uh, uh, they're, in, they're in the middle of a battle, and the admiral in charge of the fleet uh, is talking. She, he chimes in in the hologram on her bridge, on the, on the Shinzao's bridge. And he's walking around his bridge, but he's he's like walking around the the, the Shinzu bridge, and um, at the same time, and he's like, and so he'll he'll like talk to um, Captain Giorgio, mm -hmm. and then he'll and turn issue an order in his own ship. Yeah, yeah, and then he'll, and he'll like point and issue an order to his own to his own helmsman or something. So um, you know what? I bet that's the excuse for why the hollow technology doesn't fly in the years out. It's because it got too confusing. Those crews <laughs> give me orders. The admiral's yelling over my shoulder, and the captain's over here. Yeah. So the the, um, so the, there's the scene where Takuma, uh, so um, there's a, there's this, the, the Shinzao is repairing a, um, by the way, the first five minutes of this show is, is so Star Trek. Like it is so Star Trek. It is the crew of the Shinzao working together, laughing together, joking together. There's this whole thing between Burnham and, and Saru where um, Saru's the second officer on the ship, right? And uh, Burnham seemingly never agrees with anything Saru says. And Saru's always like, oh, it's dangerous? We should just go. We should just, like, take off. And, in fact, they, they come upon this, um, this, this relic that is, like, in a sensor negative zone that they can't see or read or anything. And, and, and they, they think, they, 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 they're, like, analyzing the situation. And they think, well, if somebody doesn't want us to find it, then it's probably a dangerous situation. They could have possibly damaged the relay. We should, like, go. Saru's like, yeah, we should get, we should get the heck out of here. Because he's, you know, he's a prey species and, like, wants to run at the first sign of danger. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
and uh, he's, he's a humanoid rabbit. <laughs> yeah. And so there's this great, the, the quips and the sarcasm. I mean, even the captain, like, this is a very different bridge. All, like, the captain and the first officer and the second officer are seemingly, like, ribbing each other. And it's, it just, and they're also doing work at the same time. It's kind of rapid fire. A little bit of that orville It happened. feels, it's better than, th <clears throat> that scene it is better than the Orville. Oh. Like, <clears throat> it, anything that the Orville has done so far, and don't get me wrong, I love the Orville. Um, that, this is better. This is the best instantaneous Star Trek family crew I've ever seen. Because and we're they, not going to keep them from what well, you're Well, and I'll me. tell you what, they have to set it up this way because they will tear your heart out later. And, um... And and it's it, it's fantastic. And then as we progress, we see, we 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 do have flashbacks to Burnham's uh, some Burnham's journey. She was at a a, a a Vulcan science station with a human parents that was attacked by the Klingons. So right away, there's a little bit of an emotional conflict going on, and 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 her her judgment becomes questioned later on because of that history. Uh, Sarek. Sarek mind melds with her to keep her alive. And because of that, he instills part of his katra into her. And this possibly sets up why he has uh, Bendai syndrome in the next generation and has to mind meld with Picard yep. to keep himself um, logically stable. And Does he leave a bit of his katra in Picard? Yes, because, right, because later on, Spock mind, mind melds and, and, and receives like the essence and, and the feelings of, of his father through, through Picard. Um, and through this, Sarek is actually able to, which this was a little a little weird, and I'm not sure how I feel about this, and if we'll see this more and more, but he's able to communicate with Burnham over long distances. So they have a moment where he has to basically like snap her into shape and say, look, you, 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 like she's put in a situation where she, she pretty much has to sit on the sidelines and not participate in anything. Mm -hmm. And he basically gives her a pep talk. It's like, no, you gotta, you gotta do what you do best, and you know, you're a valuable resource, and you gotta get into the fight. And um, uh, and 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 her Burnham's journey through this is very interesting because, and her flashbacks as we see her when she first comes aboard the um, the Shinzao seven years prior to this. Um, she's she's 21, I think, and she's. Uh, been to the Vulcan Science Academy. She's the only human that's gone to the Science Academy. She's gone to the to the um, to the whatever. Um, well, we know she took she must have took a savage a savage verbal beating back then. Yep, and she's very Vulcan when she first comes aboard. And and uh, Giorgio is actually a little sarcastic with her and, and and stuff, but she likes what she sees. And Burnham likes what she sees in the bridge and the way the crew works, and so decides to to stay if, if the captain will have her, and that's how she becomes a member of the crew. Flash forward to the present time, she's much more human because she's been inter interacting with human, and that actually takes a turn overboard. She actually gets too emotional in this, in, in this, in this uh, event, in this conflict. And, um, and Takuma, meanwhile, is trying to unite the houses. And how he does that is he uses this relic called the Light of Kalos to send a signal to draw the houses. And he coincides it with the, the, the Federation fleet coming and he basically he decides that he's going to bring the Federation into a war with the Klingons to unite the 24 houses of the Klingon Empire and the sad thing that happens there's the Klingons we know and the sad thing that happens is that through Burnham's actions and choices mm -hmm. it appears from Starfleet's point of view that she's the reason the war has started because she makes some pretty interesting choices uh and uh, spoiler alert, she knows how to Vulcan neck pinch. And I'm not going to tell you who she does it to, but it ain't a Klingon. The captain. It's got to be the captain. I'll just say this. The end of the first episode, which was like the midpoint of the season premiere, mm -hmm. uh, there's a standoff on the bridge of the Shinzao, and then 24 Klingon ships show up, in addition to the one that they're facing off against. <clears throat> and it, 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 it's, it's just insane. Um, Is the Shinzao even a capable ship? It is an old, and they even mention because the, the the transport room looks weird. And when when Burnham comes aboard seven years ago, she makes she says something snarky about the the. She's like, oh well, the the, the Vulcans have phased out this kind of transport technology, and she's like, well, the Shinzo is an old ship, but she's a good ship. She can still move, and 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 that's pretty evident. There's a lot of throwbacks to Enterprise, um, and and it's interesting because in preparation for this, I decided to watch the original pilot episode, The Cage. 
and the uh, the second pilot episode where no man has gone before with the first one with Kirk. And these uniforms remind me of a combination of the Enterprise uniforms and the field jackets that Pike wears when he beams down to Talos Four in the original pilot because they're like asymmetrical wraps that go over their uniforms with and they're they're a pale blue with gold trim around the sleeves and to see that style they they really pulled a lot of style from a lot of different places for these uniforms and the uniforms look fantastic on the show the and i'll tell you i i was so worried about about this that about how the show was going to be presented and how it was gonna feel, and if it was gonna feel like Star Trek, and if it was gonna be a good quality show. And I'm gonna tell you, it feels like Star Trek. It feels like Star Trek right away. The first scenes on the bridge, it feels like Star Trek. Um, the acting, the directing, the cinematography, the story, in, for me personally, hit on all cylinders. It's not like an amazing, like, you know, first episode of a TV show. But it is very solid. Uh, it's the best pilot episode ever of Star Trek. It, I'm sorry, but it's better. My favorite has always been um, Deep Space Nine. And I've always felt that Enterprise had the best pilot episode. This is the best pilot episode they've ever done. This, this, this almost feels like a movie. I mean, and it has got the quality of that. I mean, they spared no expense in this. It, is, it feels epic, but it feels personal. They, they did a great job. And I, I highly recommend you check out at least the first two episodes and then make your decision whether or not you're going to want to hit on it week to week. Because it's solid TV, man. And, uh, and it, was, it, just, it, 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 it made me feel excited. I, I remember when Enterprise was on. I was excited to watch Enterprise because it was a Star Trek show, but it wasn't a very good Star Trek show for the first couple of seasons. Yeah, I never, I, I've never watched Enterprise in sequence because the first season did nothing. I highly me. recommend you watch, if you want to watch some dark gritty attempt at Star Trek, watch the third season. If not, skip the first. No, I've skipped, the, I've skipped a bunch of episodes. I watched the Dark Mirror Universe. Yep, those are right? the episodes. I've, I, uh, I, I watched their encounter with the Borg. Yep. Uh, I mean, I've watched all the key episodes. I yeah. watched the one where Archer is removed from time, and they do yeah. more to explain all the time travel from every other Star Trek series than the other Star Trek series actually did. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's a great show. If you guys are on the fence about whether or not to subscribe, I highly recommend it. You can always subscribe for the months that, that Discovery is on and suspend your subscription until the next one. It, it, it equates to $1.25 an episode. If, you're, if, if you like good TV, check this out. It, you know, I, I just highly recommend it. What, another recommendation? He's convinced me to watch it. Another recommendation is um, it goes on hiatus, I think, in November. So wait until the halfway point and then binge watch those first, whatever, eight episodes, seven episodes or whatever. Uh, and then suspend it. You know, you can do that in a month. Then suspend it and come back and watch it at the end of the season. But I, I, I'm very excited. They do an after show, an after Trek show, like they did with The Walking Dead. Uh, and very funny. You get some insight into different stuff. You get some teases for what's to come. Very excited. This, it just, I was worried this show wasn't going to have any humor or levity to it or feel like the characters were fully realized. And right from go, I, my worries were, 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 were gone. And I'm 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 more excited about this show than I think any other show that I've that I've seen in the last year. And that's mostly I'll be honest, that's mostly because I'm a Star Trek fan. But if you're a Star Trek fan, Clips. I'm not really. Check it out. You are a Star Trek fan. I, you're not you're not like PhD fandom like mm -hmm. I am, but you're a Star Trek fan. So. I don't know what like am I a Trekker because like I like watching, but I'm not all in it. So Trekker is the PC term. Trekkie is the term. No, when I okay, well, I watched the original Trekkie documentary. Mm -hmm. Like they straight up said, someone straight up said to the camera, "A Trekker is like they enjoy watching Star Trek, right. and a Trekkie we like the lifestyle of Star Trek." So here's the thing: is that is that Trekkie at first was a derogatory term for somebody who likes Star Trek. It was making fun of people who like Star Trek. Oh, they're Trekkies. They're Trekkies. And William Shatner's famous SNL sketch where he says, "All you Trekkies need to get a life." Okay, so it was initially a derogatory one. So what happened was is that half of the fandom said, no, we are Trekkies, we're gonna own this. Mm -hmm. And the other half said, no, call us Trekkers. So a Trekkie is the correct term in my mind because that's what I feel like. All right, so I'm just I'm just a fan. You just, that, oh, you're a fan. Oh, I, I oh, have nothing else. I have okay. nothing else, I have nothing else. Just, checking, just checking your fan, all right. I'm a so, little bit of a fan. 
Um, so let's just quickly jump into uh, what did we play. Uh, I'm just going to mention I played an epic game of Star Trek Ascendancy, which I talked about last week. This is the board state at the end of the game. I played the Federation, which I played for the first time, which was great. Um, we had a Ferengi player, which yeah. they, uh, they just bought uh, uh, culture. We had a very duplicitous Romulan player. And then we had a Klingon player who duped us all and, and pretended won. to be our friend and won. Yes. And it turns out the Klingons are a little bit broken, but very quickly. I would think the, the Ferengi would be a little bit broken. Well, the Ferengi were about to win. But one of the winning conditions is in addition to having five ascendancy, you have to control your home world. Oh. And, so, and, and it has to be at the end of the round. So after everybody's taken their turn, at the end phase of the round, the first thing you do is check for victory. So if anything happens, if you get if you get your ascendancy at the beginning of your turn, and you're turn one, if something happens during that round, and you lose you lose your home world. Yeah. Oh. Like so, what ended up happening was is he had enough. Uh, oh, we just had a little earthquake. Um, he had enough uh, production to purchase what he needed for the ascendancy to win the game, and the Klingon player said nope and just rushed in. And um, took and took world. over his homeworld, took over Ferenginar. And you can see in this picture, there's Ferenginar up there. Completely invaded. Uh, Ferenginar is um, is up here, is right there, and it's got little red ships on it. Right? Yep. So he took that over. Um, and then, um, so I... Um, uh, so I'm, I'm behind you. The Earth is behind you. And this system right here... I ran in and did the first battle and tried to liberate this system from the Romulans because I suspected it was a labor camp. That was my excuse. In reality, I probably, you know, I broke a treaty too, which was sad, which was kind of a bummer. So if you attack somebody, you got to give them their treaty card back. So, yeah. Um, and then you don't get the production during the upkeep phase or whatever. So I went in and, and took over that planet. It was a dumb move for me because I, I ended up losing too many ships and I spread my forces thin. Because you don't see a lot of Federation ships on this map, do you? So um, then they attacked me. So we were fighting over here. We were fighting over here in this area. Uh, and then... Um, and meanwhile, the Klingon player, which the Klingon player's homeworld is there, he was amassing ships and, uh, and whatnot. So then the Romulan player came over and take over Earth because he didn't want me to win, except I was nowhere near danger of winning, and we weren't paying attention to how many ascendancy the Klingon player had. And the next thing we knew, the Klingon player had five ascendancy, so we had to take his home world. So the, the, the Romulan player came in to uh, Kronos down here and destroyed all of his ships but like four, right? So I took all of my production, built a fleet down here because I had a starbase there, came in through the back space lanes, went in, and you see I have two ships on Kronos because I went in with my fleet and I destroyed all of his ships. And in order to take over his home world, I had to um, uh, do what's called hegemony, which is basically uh, induct them into the Federation. And the, the Federation gets bonuses and stuff like that. Um, except, and they're not allowed to invade, so I couldn't like attack his planet. I had to do hegemony. I had to convince them to join the Federation. But it costs you one culture to attempt it, to attempt the die roll, and then one culture to actually complete the process. And I had previously, on, at the beginning of my build phase, I had turned in all of my culture for one ascendancy. So I had no culture to be able to do that. So then uh, I had to pass turn. I was the last player, and then the game ended. And the, and the Klingon, like, which is good everything. because it was like six and a half hours. Oh my god! Which is fine because we all had a good time, and it was a lot of fun, uh, and um, and it was really cool. And um, and again, I, I highly recommend that game if you have a group of guys you can play with or girls that you can get together with and and marathon it for several hours. And we did this the afternoon before I went home and watched Star Trek Discovery. So it was a great day. It was a very Star Trek-y day. And I promise you, I won't, stock, I won't talk this much about Star Trek on future podcasts, on future videos. Because, well, next week um, we have time to, to take a break for sure. Yeah. So, But I, I appreciate you all listening to, my, uh, to all my Trekky stuff. This is a very exciting time for anybody who's a fan of Star Trek. Uh, I'm really excited about the games that are coming out, this game in particular, uh, ga old games that, that are out of print now, and for the new show. So... Uh, and a potential new movie, if that does end up coming. So. JJ says it's coming. And they're saying that Chris Hemsworth is going to be in it. So. Is Kirk's dad? Time travel. 
Oh no. Oh no. I have a feeling uh, what they might do is I think Kirk might find himself in a position to be able to go back in time and save the Kelvin, and thereby possibly erasing the Kelvin timeline. Dun, dun, dun. That's a bit rough. I think what it's going to be is like City on the Edge of Forever, where he, where they go back in time and they're, they, Kirk, Kirk wants to save Edith Keeler, but if he does, the Nazis invade America. Yeah. And so he has to let her die. He has to watch her die. And I think that that might be what is going to have to happen. He, he has a choice. He can either save, he can save his father and not exist, or he can, he can, he can let his father die and, and, and maintain the timeline. They end up holding Bones back from saving her, right? Uh, no, it's Kirk. They, Bones and Spock hold Kirk back. Yeah, even though, but I was going to say, Bones had, Bones had no, only Bones, had, Bones saves her. The first time. The first time. And then, and then, um, I think it's Bone, Bone saves her the first time. And then they realize that there's another opportunity. I forget what happens, but I think it's Bones, Bones does, oh no, Bones is like sick. Yeah. And he stumbles out and I think he, I think he like pushes her out of the way by accident or something like that. So. Anyway, City of the Age of Forever, uh, you should check it out. Um, Joan Collins uh, guest star. Joan Collins guest stars. That's right, she plays yeah. Edith Keeler. Edith, Edith Keeler. Um, very great episode. So, uh, on that note, final thoughts. Um, next week, uh, uh, we, we will not have a show because we'll be traveling to New York Comic Con. Oh, with it? We've got, <laughs> uh, we've got some exciting stuff. Uh, coming, where we've we spent uh, some time today booking some interviews, um, deciding what kind of content we're going to do. If we are live at all, it'll be on the Facebook page through a Facebook Live. Probably just some short videos, some selfies of us, uh, what we're doing and whatnot. But we're going to record some content. We're going to throw a little package together for you guys, and then when we return the following week, hopefully we'll have a nice uh, a nice um, a nice show for you guys. That'll be all footage uh, from from New York Comic Con. So. Are you excited? I'm ex- so excited. I want to throw up in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the first time you've ever gone all four days? No. No? You've gone all four days before? I, uh, years one through three. Yeah. What I think was the third year... The third year was the second season of Walking Dead. I think. Right? And so I waited online all day for Robert Kirkman. All day. It was Sunday. It was actually... I think it was actually five o'clock. They were telling everyone to go home, right? And I had just reached him, and he would not move, and he stayed there, and he missed his flight to LA. And in the ninety seconds I had with him, he signed some Walking Dead stuff for a friend of mine, and he signed my hardcover Invincible Volume One. Um, and I said, you know, it's really great of you that you have stayed here and stuck it out because you want to make sure that all these people, you know, go home with the autograph they waited all day for. And I'm like, and that, you know, not everybody would, you know, put their foot down and do that. So that's really amazing. And he was like, thank you. And then we took a quick picture really quick, which is somewhere on my Facebook. Uh, and then I went home and I watched Walking Dead last night and Talking Dead premiered mm-hmm. and Kirkman was on via satellites because he did not leave New York. Wow. So that's my cool little Robert Kirkman story. But that exact, that, meant, that was meant not the last time, maybe it was year four was mm-hmm. the last time that, uh, that, I did, that I didn't go. Yes, it does, Brian. Um, yes, it does. So there, is that the same year? I, it's all a blur, right? Mm-hmm. But anyhow, there was one year, and I think it was that same year, it was really bad for me. My, I had one piece of luggage. We went to the Diamond Breakfast, which was in the Crystal Room that day. Are you going to the Diamond Breakfast this yes. year? Yes. You are? Okay, great. I'll we'll see you there. So, um... It's for Diamond people only. <laughs> so, anyhow, I was in that area. I had my bag. I'm talking to my friends. I used the bathroom. And my bag was never seen again. <gasps> And I called. No. I called. So and so my Friday was wasted because my Friday was getting on the train, coming home. It took me all day. I got home, then had to. Then my mother had. Then my mother had to pick me up, drive b- back across the river, um, pack up, pack up new stuff, come back, get a train. By the time I got back to the city, the show was over. 
You know, and I took like a seven something in the morning train. And it just, the whole day, wow. the whole day vanished. Oh, that is such a sad um, story. And, uh, right, and I kept calling. And then that Saturday and that Sunday was just noise and lights and people. And that Sunday, which I, I believe is the Kirkman Sunday, that line was unmerciful, just standing forever and ever while people came in with barrages of children all over us, all over, over, over. And it was just, I was just all I could do to maintain my mental faculties to get a, get through that line, get to Kirkman. And when I realized that the show was closing and I was just getting to him, it was just like, I just... Is it was, the last time you went? I, I, that, I'm pretty sure that's the last time I went. And I was like, this weekend destroyed me. Everything was a blur, everything was anxiety, everything was lights, everything was people pushing and shoving, and, you know... Well, this year... We're going to have a fabulous time. This year... We are. You're going to be able to take a break... Yes. ...and go to the press lounge, Mr. Press Badge, where... Uh, and get a donut and a cup of coffee and relax, and Joe told me that last year he saw Mark Ruffalo up there. Oh, good. He's and nice. And some other people just hanging out up there. I like him so. and Rosario Dawson. So for super lucky, I'll get I'll get the two for one. So um, so hopefully we're going to be able to. We've already booked a couple of interviews. Hopefully we're going to be able to book some more. Um, um, you know, comic books, entertainment people. Um, we're going to be at some great panels. We're going to be at the Tick panel. We're going to be you know we're going to be at the press at the press panels also and getting to ask these people some questions. Um, Joe, I think, is going to be doing the Hanging with Spidey exhibit where you get to walk in his room upside down and stuff. So, uh, so I the room is already upside down for us. I, well, it's something about like walking in through a fire escape and then up a wall and up the thing. I think there's, I think it's more than just that. Like I said, if there's a harness involved, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so. I exa- well, I, that's why I told him, I was like, We're I'm gonna pretty have sure this is going to be do- all you, Joe. He's yeah. like, I don't care. I'll do it. So um, Joe is coming on board. He's going he's gonna to produce uh, some content with us. Um, and he's been helping us with this whole process. So we're very excited uh, to him. Uh, we're very excited to have him. And we're um, looking forward to um, spending the weekend with him and whatnot. So um, any other thoughts? <sighs> this is a big week in comics, people. I, I, you know, that's the other thing, too. I don't understand how we have big weeks in comics. It's almost intentional. It's almost like they planned this because New York Comic Con is coming. It's like some yeah. sick, twisted game. Ugh. I don't know what to do with myself. I'm actually, I'm really excited for who we're going to see at the show. So, fingers crossed. I'm very excited, too. Uh, hopefully, I'll get into the Star Trek Discovery panel. And on that note, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking with us. I'm Tony Cox. I'm Clifford Parmiter. And, and be- maybe. Maybe. Just maybe. Dude. They should tweet us or write us or yes. something. Yes, check in. Um, I've been lagging on setting up a, a Facebook or a Twitter or some kind of official contact thing. But tweet us up here. Let us know how you're doing, what you guys are reading, what you're interested in. And uh, hopefully sometime soon we'll start interacting with some um, some uh, viewer feedback. So thank or you for we'll watching. Have, or we'll, have to, we'll have to kidnap people. Well, I'm going to steal that Kryptonian technology. On that note, people, <laughs> lock your doors, and we'll see you guys again. Doors uh, won't save you. Uh, check us out on the Kerwin's Facebook page for any live content from New York Comic Con. And if not, we'll see you in two weeks. You guys have a good night, and thank you for watching.